Uh, thank you guys for coming out. We're gonna quickly go through a talk on how to build an application security program. Uh, thanks to Will for inviting me out to give this talk. Um, just a little bit about me. My name is Jerry Gamblin. I do something at Kenna Security. I'm not exactly sure what. Uh, when I started, Ed Bellis told me I get to pick what my title was. I'm really thinking I'm gonna go with the shrug emoji. That's probably where I'll end up. Um, just gonna do a little bit of time on my journey to application security. Sitting around and thinking about it, I've spent 20 years in security now. Nearly right out of high school, right into security. My very, very first job was with the government. Um, I spent 10 years there. It was a very, very interesting 10 years. I learned so much. I had all the time in the world. I could do any amount of research I wanted. I could learn to code. I could hack on things. I had a budget of zero dollars. I remember when I got a Nessus license, uh, going through procurement on that and getting that was one of the hardest things I've ever done. That was $2,000. But I learned so much. I would never trade those 10 years. It gave me a really solid base in what the technology was and what I was doing. Um, From there, I took the lead security role at Carfax. This was almost 180 degree flip from where I was at with the government. Um, for those who don't know, Carfax is part of the world's largest data company. We have about 1,500 individual data points on every car in the United States from you know when the last time your oil was changed to if you got into a fender bender. So we were doing this at a massive scale. I think when we left, we had just about 20,000 servers. So I'd gone from a place where I had no money to spend to I had basically all the money I could spend. Um, and it really opened my eyes because I quickly learned that people matter way more than tools. You could give me $100,000 today and I'd go out and buy the latest SAS or DAS tool and it would make no difference, right? You have to have somebody to sit in front of that tool, no matter how awesome it is, and to run it. And I learned automation is the way to the future, but it's not there yet. When you start thinking about how to build your application security program, you're gonna have people come in and give you these sales pitches about, oh, we could automate 95% of your, you know, your DevOps workflow. Ask them to show you a company that's been there, right? because the best companies I've seen are about 65 to 70% automation in their dev, DevOps workflow. I then ended up on the security research team at Kenna, and this has been a really, really interesting uh, journey for me. This is my first startup. We're a mid-stage startup, so we're pretty, pretty solid, but it's also really different. I have a good budget, management is great, but I'm now working with people who wrote this code from the ground up. So they have really, really invested ownership that I haven't seen before, right? So when you start talking about code, you're not talking about, oh, some function that somebody else wrote and then transferred three departments over. You're normally talking to the person who wrote the code two years ago. So it's really, really opened my eyes to what personal equity and personal pride in an, in an environment looks like. Sorry, we need to drink of water real quick. So I'm just gonna jump right into some lessons learned. We only have 30 minutes today and I wanna make sure that I get through these. Um, there is no perfect tool for AppSec. Um, my boss at the government said that if application security was easy, the security team would just do it, right? They would just buy whatever the other Nessus is for AppSec, throw it in and run it. Application security is a totally different beast. Um, here's an eye chart that we use when we talk about application security tools. You know, there are five different variants in application security. Here's all the steps. Here are the 40 tools that you can use if you need application security, you know, from your static analysis to your IDE, all the way up to your bug bounty and penetration test. And for everybody who is um, taking pictures, I will just post these on, on the line right after I get off stage, so you don't have to do that. What? Uh, I will put them on internal.dev. 
So this is, uh, Jonathan Cran isn't in the building today yet, but this is a slide that he makes and talks to. It talks about the overlay between your average uh, static application security tool and your dynamic application security tool. 10% is about what you get. So if you're starting an application security program, you have to go out and buy the best static analysis tool that you can find for your language. If it's Ruby, you know, you might pick up Breakman. If it's, you know, if it's Go, you might start a company and write one because there isn't one. Um, and then you have to find what you're gonna use for your dynamic application security testing. There are a ton of good, good offers out there that you can find a ton of great tools. <laughs> Automation is hard, period. Um, when I talk to people about how to think about automation, I try to, the first step I do is I try to sit down and have them draw out what their workflow looks like. From, if you start today and you need to rebuild your stack from the server to code deployed, what does that look like? And 95% of the time, I cannot find one person who can, in a company who can sit down and start from, oh, here's how we provision a server. Here's how we set the DNS records. Here's how we get the TSL cert. Here's how we install everything. Here's how we push the code. Here's how we make it live in our production cluster. That is where you have to start with automation. It's from the basics, getting in a room with a whiteboard and figuring out what your flow actually looks like, and then you can automate it. Um, these are my top five goals for automation. I always want to be able to move application and security closer to the developer, those decision points. They quote unquote own the code, they need to see what I see as fast as I see it. And then of course the all configuration should be static and you know, we should just be able to run out and everything should be the same. Even the best organizations fail on this. I can't tell you how many organizations I've talked to said, oh yeah, we just build everything out of Puppet and then they get an external penetration test done and they have 20 or 25% drift. It's like, you said that you build all your servers with the same script. How do you have any drift in your environment? It's just natural and once you realize that even with the best automation program you're gonna have drift, you can really then work on shorting that up. And then testing at every stage, that's harder than you think. It's, it's easy to test at your static stage when you put code in and at your dynamic stage. But it's those middle, middle tests, right? Like on your IDE. Are you guys all using the same linter, right? I cannot tell you how many fights I've had with my developers about linter rules. I don't write the linter rules. We picked a linter and we're gonna use it. And if it says you have to have four spaces here, you have to have four spaces here, right? Like those are the types of tools that you have to come to an agreement with. Now kind of into the soft part of this talk. Um, let's talk about management management. Um, so I have two takes here. The first take is talking to your management is like having a cat, right? They don't wanna see you as a security team unless you have something for them or they need something from you. That might be harsh, but just showing up and saying, hey, I have this problem, can I just tell you my problem and not give you a solution is gonna end badly for you. Um, I was lucky enough to hear Colin Powell give a leadership talk one time, and he says, the best way to be a leader is to always follow these three communication points when you go to talk. It's tell them what you know, tell them what you don't know, and then tell them what you think based on what you know and don't know, in that order. How many times I've messed that up in my life? I, it's a zillion times because I always start with what I think is gonna happen, right? Like, oh yeah, I think that we're gonna, gonna lose all our data here without talking about, I know that we're running an old version of SQL. I don't know if there's a, a live vulnerability. If there is, the worst thing that could happen is we could have a data breach. <sighs> Let's talk about product management. Uh, no better friend, no worse enemy, right? How many of you guys work directly with your product managers in your company? They are responsible for everything. 
I, I tried to figure out like what my product manager does. She's actually sitting back there, Emily. Um, she's in charge of her roadmap. She's in charge of her day-to-day -day work. And then she's in charge of me showing up and saying, hey, we've had this bounty submission. Uh, can we get this prioritized? And she's always like, we'll try, but is it more important than these 40 other things that we're working on today? Product management is easily the hardest job in any technical organization. I do not know how they do it. Uh, developer relations. Do we have any full-time developers here? Good. <laughs> um, Mark Berry gave this quote at a, I think it was RubyConf two years ago, and it basically says that developers don't want to do anything but write new code. And I had a really snarky slide after this, but I took it out. Because it's true, right? Developers get burnt out when they don't get to do what they want. But my job is to normally bring them stuff they don't want to do. Has anybody here found a developer who just loves to update frameworks? Who's like, because if you do, we're going to hire them away from you. I don't care how much it costs. I, because it's no fun to update frameworks. It's no fun to do input validation. Every developer wants to go in and build the next widget or the next connector or whatever your thing needs. So dealing with developers is super hard. Here's some stuff that I've done over the last two or three years that's really helped. I've hosted some dev security training. I have a company that, if you want to talk to me offline, I'll give you the name of. They do a really great job. They come in and they have live code and they teach them what burp looks like and, and, and gives the devs hands-on experience on the tools that I use every day that they might not have seen so that they kind of understand what these vulnerabilities look like. Because the sooner they see the vulnerabilities, the more likely they are to, to really dig in to fix them. Um, we hosted a CTF for our dev team. Uh, we didn't host one. OWASP Chicago hosted a CTF. I took three or four of my devs to that. They loved it. It was the first time that many of them had seen a real life vulnerability and understand what it's like. It was like, oh, this is what it looks like, what a SQL injection looks like. Here's what somebody would sit down and hack this bank and pull this data down. It was one of the, the things, just sitting there and watching these guys for the first time, just seeing that light bulb go up. Oh, this is what would happen if I could get access to this database. You know, if I could read this table that I'm not supposed to. And then the, the hardest one that I'm still working on is to teach them basic threat modeling. Threat modeling is hard for me. It is super hard to teach a development team or a management team, right? You have to say, OK, you built this amazing product. Now I need you to sit here and just flip the script and tell me how you would break it. Can you do that? How would a bad guy use this, right? Like, write an abuse story. That is super hard. That's something that I'm still dealing with today. I don't have a great answer for it. But I know that at least trying to get those concepts in is, is where I'm going. Time management is so hard. I like to hack stuff. I have no time to hack stuff, right? I have probably, I've looked at my calendar over the last month. I have roughly 50 to 60% of my time are pre-standing meetings, right? That's just where I need to be in a meeting, not doing my job. And then you've got just the written communications you need to do, right? Like, I really have to get in the Slack channel and talk about what hamburger is the best in Chicago, or my opinion won't count, right? And then you got to work on your tickets, and you got to you know, make sure Emily knows what I need. I'm dealing with external vendors. By the end of the day, I have very, very little time to hack anything, right? Like, in this role, running an application security program, most of my hacking happens at home when I'm not supposed to be working. Uh, We'll get to this point in a minute, but if, you don't, if you're not at a meeting, your opinion doesn't carry the same weight, right? I can't slack in, hey, I need this cross-site vulnerability bug fixed, and that carry the same weight as if I go to a meeting for an hour, wait for my five minutes to talk about why I need a bug fixed. So some of it's just people management, like Rachel was talking about, right? If you show up, people are going to take you more seriously. <sighs> Budget management. You have to have a standalone security budget. You cannot run a security program on handouts. Just at a general, like, you can find a good SaaS 
a static tool for about five grand. Uh, dynamic tools are super expensive. They cost anywhere from $10,000 to Texas dollars, right? Like you can spend any amount of money you want on a good static tools. Uh, consulting is $20,000 a week. Like that, that's the baseline for application security consulting. That's why I wanna go into application security consulting. If anybody's, no, okay. And then growth management. This has been where I've, I've fall down, right? It's like, oh, we're gonna spin up a new team, right? And then I'm not smart enough like everybody else in the company to ask for more money when it's the new team. Hey, we're building a new product and it's gonna be 20% more, so everybody else is in line to ask for 20% more. I'm overlooking at the Slack thread on hamburgers because I wasn't thinking right. Now let's have, go through everybody's favorite part. We're gonna go through my failures. Um, <laughs> thank you, Winston Churchill. He needed that after World War I. Um, not learning to program. I know that this is a really, really hot button issue in security now. People are like, oh, you don't have to know how to program to be in security. Yet yeah, you don't. I mean, you don't know, have to know how to like fly a jet to be an air traffic controller. But if you wanna be able to talk to these developers, you have to, at a basic level, know what they're doing and be able to talk shop with them. It's just what they want, it's what they need. I have a goal to be able to be able to, to drop in and do an entry level job on every team in my technical organization. And I think that that's when you know that you're a solid security professional. When, hey, if the sysinj guy if, is out for today, you could go over there and be the junior sysinj guy today and build servers. You might not be fast, but you could do it. Hey, is your Ruby developer out sick for today? Can I go and sit at the Ruby devs desk and be the junior person on that team and not need to be handheld all day? That's kind of where I'm leaning. <laughs> Not understanding the business. I know so many security people who, who basically end up like this. This is a quote that I love from a comedian who was in San Francisco and now she lives in New York. She says, having a kid is like having a tiny drunk friend who thinks you're incredibly rich. And sometimes I think security Security teams operate under that standard. I fall into this all the time. I remember one time asking for a $20,000 review on a product that was scheduled to make $40,000 over the course of a year. I don't know if anybody's done uh, any business school in here, but spending $20,000 to have something reviewed that's gonna make $40,000 will get you laughed out of a room pretty, pretty quick. Um, I, I see people who are willfully ignorant of what their company does and how their company makes money in the security industry to a point where, where it's embarrassing. You're like, oh, what does your company do? It's like, oh, we sell something, but I'm just on the security team. It's like, no, you're on the I sell something team and security is your role there. But then this also flips back to the, if you don't have a budget, there is, you don't have a program, right? I love open source software. I contribute to open source software. You cannot run an application security program on open source software. You can supplement your application security program with open source software, but it's just not there. And the best tools end up getting bought by big companies who have four, you know, for profit products. I love Breakman. We had Breakman Pro, which was a paid product, but it was, it was super cheap they've been bought by a bigger company, right? We use the RubySec, those guys have been acquired by GitHub. So even your open source program, those guys are sitting there and it's not hard to see them getting swallowed up into a bigger organization. So to think that you can run an application security program with open source software is, is a fallacy. <sighs> Titles matter. I can't see that on that screen. I love the office. And there's a huge difference between being the assistant to the regional manager and being the assistant regional manager. I don't know how many times I've been in a meeting and it's been, oh yeah, this is a manager's meeting and we're gonna invite the security guy who's not a manager. You just don't carry the same weight. If you're supposed to be on the peer level with a group to get decisions made for your application security program, it's only fair that you carry that titles, right? 
That's why there are CISOs now who sit at the board level. We just need to take that same thinking and roll it down. If you're the application security professional and you need to go and talk to development managers about getting stuff done, you need to be the application security manager, right? That's the only way it works. I know we want to live in a world where titles don't matter and, and you know, nobody cares, but that's not reality. <sighs> communication. I suck at communication. I suck so bad at communication that I actually now have a communication coach. I would suggest that you guys get one. It's, it's really helpful. Um, luckily, I live in Columbia, Missouri, the University of Missouri. We have a student group called the Antlers. Uh, they are basically professional hecklers. And we have a very good basketball coach called, called um, Quanzo Martin. He's really good. The problem is, I want to think that I'm the coach most of the time, when reality is people see me as the heckler. They see me on the outside, not knowing what they're able to do, yelling at them to, hey, try harder, run faster. And they're like, oh, you didn't think we thought about maybe running faster here? You know, it's really hard to not be a heckler in application security or security in general and move to being a coach. And that's what I would like to be a takeaway from this is to think about when you're communicating, is this being seen as like, I'm just heckling these people? Am I bringing anything that they really see? Or do I have the authority? Do I know what they're going through? Have I learned to program enough that when I sit down and talk to them about fixing something, they see me as a coach? So just a quick review, <laughs> you have to communicate, period. Work on your communications. I should just have this on here 40,000 times. Um, there is no perfect tools, but you have to have a dynamic tool and you have to have a static tool. If you do not have either one of those in your environment today, you have to go out and buy one. Uh, product management is your friend. You have to understand what they're going through. You have to understand where the business pressure is coming from. I had. I saw a diagram. They sit in the middle of all those decisions. So if you have any security application stuff that you need done, they have to be on your team. Automation is really hard to do. You have to do it anyway. Nobody is growing their security teams faster than they're growing the rest of their program, right? So they just expect because they go to Black Hat and they go to RSA and they hear how easy automation is, so they're gonna come back and say, hey, we're just gonna automate all this stuff and we're gonna grow all our development teams 20%, the security team is staying flat this year. So if you know that that's the way it's working, you have to spend time to work on your automation. Understand your business, understand how you guys turn a profit, understand what's profitable for your company. There is no better way to get a bug fixed than to walk in and know how much this bug could cost your company. If you know that this bug is in your purchase path, and you know your purchase path makes $10,000 an hour, that's a number that the business loves to hear, right? Like, hey, if this is exploited and we go down, we're gonna lose $10,000 an hour, is a lot better than, hey, there's this bug on our credit card page, we should really fix it, it's important. Titles matter, but budgets matter more. Security tools are expensive, and they keep getting more expensive. And you have to communicate. But at the end of the day, there's no right way. In 20 years, and I've stepped through and seen three different versions, and I don't know, I cannot parachute into your organization and help you build a successful application security program. I can tell you what's worked for me, I can tell you the pitfalls I've had, I can tell you where to look. But every organization's different, every culture is different, and you have to figure out what your culture is and what you can do to help steer the ship towards security. Uh, thank you guys very much. I'll throw these slides on a link on internal.dev today at some point. Uh, I think that we have questions, but they're supposed to be on some app. Uh, so there's one question, which is, we have a security-focused team with buy-in from the devs to perform regular framework updates, but updates are a time-consuming task. Um, but these features, and there are no new features that get built during this time. So any tips on moving this process along? Or? No, no, if they could give me some tips, nobody likes to update frameworks, right? You go and you say, hey, we need you to update this jQuery framework, and they're like, 
that takes a week of dev time and provides zero new features, I really want to build a new feature. You just have to be, you have to go back and say, I understand that I would like to be building a new feature too, but this jQuery is old, here are the vulnerabilities, we just have to do it. It's, it's part of hygiene. I have a nine-year-old, mm -hmm. and I can't tell him why brushing his teeth every day is important versus that if you don't, it's gonna be bad in six months, right? Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to just take care of it every day to make sure that, it, that it's good on a whole. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys.